Hey there, thanks so much for checking out one of our messages here at Life Bible Fellowship Church. And we know there are two great ways you can connect with us. You can visit our website at lbf.church to learn more about all of our ministries and what we believe. And also, you can subscribe to us on YouTube to make sure that you don't miss one of our future videos. What a beautiful thing that all the earth will shout his name. Every tribe, every tongue will shout together. My name is Emma Taylor. I'm part of Exit 83 Student Ministries. And today I will be reading Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you. As people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is God's word. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. You just said the magic words, and look what you did. And look at the world of savings at Toys R Us this Christmas. From worlds of wonder, it's laser tag. Fire the laser tag starlight and send an infrared beam of light to the laser tag star center. Swell! Also comes with a star belt, all for only $44.99. Get additional star sensors and other laser tag gear from worlds of wonder at Toys R Us. It's the world's biggest Toys R Us go! Did anybody have those laser tag guns? Anybody have those? Oh, I wanted those so bad. Oh, those were the best ever. Now, for, for you older people, I didn't say old, I said older, you remember the Toys R Us Christmas catalog? Right, the hours, and, and maybe even farther back, the Sears Christmas catalog? And all the hours, like, pouring through those, circling the things that you want and just like leaving it out in the open, right? Tearing out pages and being like, I've got to show somebody this, right? And uh, the, the longing, the hope that all you needed was that A-Team van with Mr. T action figure. <laughs> it's gonna change your life. That was all you hope for. Now, if you're a little younger, the months and hours spent carefully crafting your Amazon wish list, <laughs> right? Highlighting, sending links, creating notes that you make available publicly just for anybody to be able to see. And the, the hope that we put into these things, the longing, oh, I can't wait for the day to see. And if we didn't get it Christmas morning at home, that's okay, we still had grandpa and nanny, right? <laughs> and so, the, the longing of, of all of that, and we, I mean, from the youngest age, we, we started singing songs about the longings that we had, had at Christmas, right? All I want for Christmas is? Okay, note to self, no Christmas choir this year. Um, right, okay, um, and then as Bing Crosby so eloquently crooned, I'm dreaming of a... Oh, and you know the season is here. The first time you hear this on Coast 103.5. Oh, oh, it's here. The longing that we have, this, this desire in our hearts for, for these things. Now, this is referred to by many as the season of Advent, okay? Which is the hoping, the longing for Christ to return, right? And the celebration that he has been here and he has done everything necessary for us to be able to have relationship with our Heavenly Father. 
And that's something to have hope in. That's something that, that we celebrate. And the themes of Advent are hope, peace, joy, and love, right? And over the next four weeks, we're going to be diving into these themes of Advent, but I want to encourage you to do it in this way. As we talk about, like today, we're talking about hope. And as we talk about hope, I want you to seriously consider in your own life, in your faith, in your relationship with Jesus, or if you're here this morning and you're, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, you're just here for a little religion in your life, let me first just say, I'm so glad that you're here. You should be here. You should keep coming because you're gonna hear truth here that's gonna bring you life, life beyond what you expect, life beyond what you could do for yourself. So if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, keep coming because I believe that God's gonna move in your life, God's gonna speak to you. But as, and so as we're, we're talking about hope, I want you to consider this with two words. Enter in. Are you entering in to the hope, the peace, the joy, the love that God has for you? Enter in, okay? Not just observe, not just sing songs about, not just decorate for, but actually enter in to this hope-filled relationship, this hopeful experience that goes beyond what you'd be able to do for yourself. It goes beyond what you could conjure up, what you could make happen, what any lights or decorations or, or gifts could ever do. Are you in a place where you're going, okay, all, all the fun stuff of Christmas, okay, it's fun, it's, it, that's great. But God, I'm ready to enter in. I'm ready to enter into whatever you have for me, beyond my understanding, beyond what, just, just learning and reading what, what the Bible says and just being like, okay, I comprehend that, actually entering in to the promise of God in what he's offered us through Jesus. So as we talk about this over the next few weeks, are you ready to enter in? Now, as we consider entering in, I have a question about this, okay? So we have a gift here, and in case you can't see it from wherever you're at, the tag says best gift ever. Best gift ever. Do you believe that this is the best gift ever? No, you don't. You know how I know you don't? It's still here. It's still sitting here. If you believed that that was the best gift ever, no stage, no wrapping paper no, would be able to keep you from it. You'd be like, oh, I've got to have that. That's entering in. That's longing. That is expectation where we go, there, there's nothing, not my mood, not my circumstances, not my, my rationale and my logic, nothing is gonna keep me from getting what is available to me. And that's often what happens with, with things like this is, the, the reason you didn't come up here, which by the way, thank you, because it's a prop, but the reason you didn't get up here and tear into this is because one, maybe you weren't sure it was for you. You're like, well, I'm not gonna go take something that's not mine. Or two, you go, you know, I don't know. It's probably not that great. I mean, best gift ever. I mean, that might be a little exaggeration. And so, it's, it, I, I don't know, it, it, is it really worth climbing up onto the stage, potentially like doing something that you're not sure? So either one, you don't know if it's for you, two, you're not sure it's really worth it. These are the kinds of things that hold us back from entering in to the things that God has for us. These are the reasons that we settle for religion. These are the reasons that we believe that the most that God could possibly do is give me some sort of like feeling inside on a Sunday when they start a song that we like, or when the message is humorous enough or deep enough, or when we, we go through the rituals of, of either faith or our families or whatever, these, this, that's, that's it. So. And maybe you're wrestling today when it comes to this gift that God has for you, this gift of hope that God has for you, 
and you're wondering, is this really for me? Maybe you're wrestling with, do I deserve this? The answer to that is no. But you know what? He's gifting it to you anyway. Maybe you're wrestling with, I, I, don't, I don't know if I qualify. The answer is no. But he's gifting it to you anyway. He's making that available to you anyway. And in the Bible, which is God's word to us, we are given such a picture of a promise of relationship that we should be tearing into, that we should be entering into going, I've got to have that. Why, why would I not? I mean, look at it. Look at it. Sometimes we get mixed up because we're like, oh, well, it's not shaped like something I want. It doesn't look like a 1968 Gibson ES335 guitar. So eh, then we move on to the other one. Is it really worth it? But we are promised in God's word to us when he talks to us going, look, it's not only is it for you, let's start there. Okay, Galatians 3.26, we're promised that if we put our faith in Jesus, we are forgiven for the ways that we have lived against God, that's sin, and we are called children of God. As you put your faith in Jesus, you are a child of God. You know what that means, who this gift is for? You. The gift of hope is for you. As you put your faith in Jesus, the gift of hope is for you because you're a child of God. And we see that this gift is eternal salvation. Relationship with the almighty God and everlasting life when this one's done. And until this life is done, we see that in this relationship as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, what is evidenced in our life is supernatural love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's a gift I wanna get into. So that is evidence to us that this gift is for us and this gift is worth opening. It's worth it. He's given this to us because it's gonna bring us life. But we do this with God where we hear about it. We're like, hey, the gift of everlasting life, the gift of supernatural love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, hope, joy, peace, love. And we go, look at it. And we admire it. We stand here and we go, boy, look how great that gift is. And we never open it. We may show up every day going, wow, look how great this gift is. And we never open it. Sometimes on Sundays we go, wow. Wow. Are we ready? Are we willing to enter in? As I've been praying over this morning, as I've been, as I've been praying for you, I believe that there is, there is stuff that God wants to do in people's lives here to bring you in, to bring you closer than you've ever been before. That God, God wants to speak to the people who are here this morning who keep believing the lie that this isn't for you. Who keep, who keep believing the lie that you're not good enough, that you don't deserve it. After what you did, after the language you use, after the ways you failed in your marriage, as the ways that you let your, your temper get the best of you, that uh, hope, not for you. But as we, as we enter in, 
if you take God's word seriously, one of the things that we see about hope is that it is the expectation that God's gonna move and the expectation that there are better days ahead. Now, this is where we, we come up short in the sense of what is your idea of better days ahead? Sometimes my expectation of a better day is just a good day plus a little bit. Sometimes my expectation of a better day is just not worse than today. And our expectation, the level of better days, what are you open to? Because the level of hope you are expecting to enter into will be dictated by who you believe this savior of the world was, is. That's what's gonna dictate what you hope for. Is it gonna be just a little more? Is it gonna be life changing? Is it gonna redirect your life from you trying real hard, doing everything that you can do, succeeding in school, succeeding in business, succeeding with your family, and trying your hardest, and just hope for the best? Or is it gonna mean something supernatural happens in your life, and you trust that it's gonna be the work of God in you that's gonna bring the change that you can't bring yourself. It's, go, it's going to set you free. It's gonna break you from the things in life that are holding you down, and we're gonna talk about that in just a second. In his letter to the believers in Rome, Paul said, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, what? Hope. It's not a very easy journey to hope, right? And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. Another translation says this hope in God does not disappoint. Imagine a hope that does not disappoint. It doesn't run out of batteries. It doesn't break. It's not less impressive because it doesn't resemble what was in the commercial. It doesn't seem to work that way. This hope does not disappoint. And this is gonna be key for what we're gonna talk about this morning and moving on in the coming weeks. Because some of you, when it comes to hope, you have enough hope to get you here. You have enough hope to get you to church and your, and your hope is in whatever happens up here on the stage. But you head back to work, you head back to your family and you're wondering where it went. And it's even caused you to go, all right, Jeff, I hear you talking about this hope. <sighs> I don't wanna be disappointed. I don't wanna keep getting my hopes up that God's gonna change me or God's gonna change my family or God's gonna, and so I better handle it. The hope that he promises, the hope that we see in here as you read this is a hope that doesn't disappoint. It's not gonna be a hope where you're like, oh, well that was less than spectacular. Cause I'm telling you, Mr. T in that van is much smaller than I thought he would be. And we do that with God, where we're like, oh, I'm afraid God's gonna be much smaller than I hoped he would be. And he promises that this hope will not disappoint because this is a spirit-filled hope. So what are you longing for? What are you longing for in your heart, right here, sitting here this morning? What are you longing for? You're just like, ah, oh, that. Will you dare yourself to hope? But it's gonna require that you don't just keep hoping in yourself. You know that doesn't work. Will you hope in the one who does not disappoint? And in, in Isaiah chapter nine, you can turn there in your Bible or if you've got your phone or iPad, you can look at it on your eyeball. You can 
see that this is a prophetic message. One of the aspects of prophecy is that God speaks to people through people. So Isaiah was a prophet. So God is gonna speak through Isaiah to the people. And starting in chapter nine, it paints this picture of people in darkness and fear and despair. Some of you here this morning, you're like, yep, that's me. But then says, but there is hope and light and peace that's coming. Not because of some political policy, not because you've figured out how to run your family perfectly. There's hope and it's a prophetic word of this is what's coming for them. Isaiah 9, starting in verse one. Nevertheless, okay, stop. Nevertheless means that he's talking about something prior to this. And so in chapter eight, what you see is that Israel has rejected God and rejected God's command, rejected God's promise, and so they are living in darkness, they're living in despair. But God has planned at some point to bring a light. And he's speaking here, it's, it's interesting, he, he's speaking in past tense because it's a prophetic word of something that's going to happen, so for us it's already happened. So here we go. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. Anybody here, you're feeling gloomy? You're feeling distressed? The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. The gloom of, of, of the judgment that the people were under will not be their future. That's a good promise, right? That's something where you're like, all right, I wanna hope in that that the gloom that they're experiencing is not their future. Gloom and distress, right? To honor. Amen. God, bring it into our lives. Deep darkness to great light. Man, it's easy to sit in the dark, yeah? Man, you can get comfortable. I get sleepy in the dark. So I could never live in Washington, right? It's just like too gloomy, too dark. Man, it's easy to settle in. He's going, look, where there is gloom, where there is deep darkness, there is light that's coming. There is light available. And he goes on to reference how God has humbled the nations of Zebulun and Naphtali, and in the future, blessing will come through in, in, in Galilee, right? In the nation of Galilee which as I recall, if you keep reading, Jesus did quite a bit of ministry where? Galilee, right? Okay. Um, now, these, this next portion, it, this passage of scripture really paints this picture of like the, the anticipation of childbirth. I read one guy phrase, he's like, these verses are full of pregnant phrases. Maybe pun intended, although I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, and when you're waiting for the birth of a child, that is never casual excitement, right? You talk to a mom or a dad who are current or like expecting a child soon, it's never like, oh yeah. At some point, I guess. It's never casual. It is always an excitement of like, yes, I cannot wait. I want this to happen. It can't come soon enough. So let's pause for a second. As, as you read this, as you read God's word, do you feel great anticipation for what he promises and desires to do in your life? Just for yourself. Doesn't matter what the per whether the person next to you feels the same way, for you. Do you read God's promises? Do you read God's truth, the word of God, and do you get like a person awaiting childbirth you go, yes, God, do that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control at supernatural levels. Yes, I'm ready. 
Or do we look at it and we go, okay, that's, that's really nice. I'm not sure it's for me. Or I'm not sure it's gonna be that great. Do you read this? Do you live this relationship with this kind of great anticipation? Do you believe that it's available to you? And I'm really feeling like even as I'm talking right now, that is a battle that some of you are really in. You just, you're, the battle is you don't feel like it's for you. It might be for your family. It might be for your kids. In fact, you believe it for your kids. You send them to youth group. You send them to life kids. You, 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 you believe it for them, but you don't believe it's for you. It's for you. Every day, it's for you. Verse three, you have enlarged the nations and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. The nation of God is enlarged as people come to faith. And the one who he's saying is coming, who we know Jesus has come, is the one who does that. Verse four, for as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. God shatters the yoke that has been put on his people. There's lots of slavery imagery coming from a nation that had been in bondage in Egypt. So that's where this imagery is coming from. And it says that God shatters the yoke that has been put on his people. So for you today, what are you a slave to? It might be a behavior, it might be a mindset, it might be an attitude, it might be a habit. What are you a slave to where you're going, this is what dictates whether I have hope or not. This is what dictates whether or not I believe that this is actually for me. I'm saying with confidence, not because I'm saying it with confidence, but because this is God's word to us. God wants to break that off you. God wants to break off that yoke of slavery. He does not want you to live in it. He is not looking at you going, well, you're the one who keeps screwing up, so you just suffer. You just keep being in bondage, I don't even care. That is never the heart of God. He wants to break these things off you this morning. These things that have held you captive. He removes the bar that holds you down and the rod that oppresses you. Anybody want to be free to hope again this morning? You want to be free to hope? Because if I were to ask you, hey, do you want to have hope? Every person in the room would be like, uh-huh. But if we were to go through and be like, hey, do you feel like you are free to have hope? There would be all kinds of reasons for all kinds of people that would be like, well, no. I believe there is hope and I would like hope. I don't believe I'm free to hope. God wants to remove that from your life today. God wants you to embrace the truth that he removes the bar that holds you down and the rod that oppresses you. And in case you're thinking that your yoke, that your rod is too great, as I'm say, like talking, you're like, yeah, but Jeff, you don't, you don't understand the slavery I'm in. You don't understand the rod holding me down. I mean, this is a big rod. This is, I mean, it's powerful. Well, in verse four, he references something about Midian's defeat. For on the day of Midian's defeat, that goes back to something, to an encounter in the book of Judges earlier on, chapter seven, where Gideon's army, a massive army, of 300 people come up against the Midianites. The description of that is that they covered the land like locusts. There is no way that Gideon's 300 guys, no matter how hard they tried, was going to be able to beat the Midianites. But God says, uh-huh. So Gideon's army blows their trumpets and all the Midianites start fighting each other and drive each other 
off the land. So if you're here this morning and you're going, yeah, yeah, but the yoke of my slavery, the rod that oppresses me is just too great and too big. You realize what you're saying about God? That even though God has done this before, even though God has promised to do it again in huge, miraculous ways, yeah, uh, but not for Jeff in 2022. You need to reject that lie. You need to take that lie captive to the authority of Christ and be like, no, 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 no more. I will be set free because God breaks the yoke of the bondages of sin. God sets us free in his mighty power and this is what we have hope in. There's nothing you can face where hope in the Lord should not be expected. There's nothing you should face where hope in the Lord should not be what you expect, what you go, yes, God, okay, I'm ready, come and do this. Romans 8.37 says, we are more than conquerors through Christ who gives us strength. We're more than conquerors. So whether it's your job, your marriage, your friendships, your schooling, in all of these things, our hope is not in ourselves. It can be, I mean, you can try it if you want to. Hope that's not in ourselves, but in the almighty God is what sets us free. Verse five, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Okay, gross. And what? (laughs) This is saying that even through the difficulties and the hurt and the battles that you've walked through, all of that stuff, the things that have come against you, God is going to be faithful, again, to his word, is gonna be faithful to use that as fuel for the fire of life in your life. God's gonna use the blood stains, the boots, the heart, all all of these things that have come against you that you could roll over and be like, ah, it's too much, I can't overcome this. And God's going, no, 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 no. I'm gonna use that stuff as fuel for the fire. God can do this in our lives. Jesus declared, in this world, you'll have trouble, but I have come to what? Overcome the world. Yes, hope. That's why we have hope. Not because I can try harder or I can figure this out. Jesus, I've come, in this world, you'll have trouble. It's gonna be hard, there's gonna be blood, there's gonna be boots, there's gonna be all these things. But you're gonna be able to overcome the world. Romans 3, Paul reminds us that in all things, God works them together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That God's gonna take all the hurt and the brokenness and the turmoil as we surrender it to him. And we go, God, I need you to bring this life and he's gonna use it for fuel in your life. So the stuff that's beating you down, the stuff that you're just tired of, the habits that you can't break, God's going, give it to me. I'm gonna use it as fuel for the fire. Why? Because in him, we are more than conquerors. There is the temptation to walk around like we're not conquerors. We walk around just feeling beat up and we're just, it's too much and I I can't handle this anymore and I don't know what I'm gonna do and God's going, right. But in me, you're more than conquerors. Will you trust in that? And if this is the promise, if this is the hope, where is this coming from? Verse six, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Wonderful Counselor, an infinitely wonderful counselor. Who are you putting your hope in? Who do you turn to? Romans 11 says all counsel, counsel that you want, comes from God. Psalm 73, we saw this last week. Asaph declared, you guide me with your counsel. Are you inviting God to do that? He's a mighty God, an infinitely strong God. There is nothing that you're going to face where God is, you know, 
alongside you, pacing back and forth going, oh, I don't know, Steve. Uh, yeah, I don't know what we're gonna do either. I don't, you know, we imagine God kind of like, or God standing back and going like, yeah, I don't know, you got yourself into this. He is an infinitely mighty God. How mighty is the God that you put your hope in? Is he the best version of you? Plus a little bit. That, that can be easy to slip into, right? If we're struggling, we're not, well, God might be able to handle the car keys thing, but the whole marriage thing, I don't know, I'm just gonna have to work on that myself. Who is the mighty God that you're putting your faith in? Psalm 147 says, great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. All right, I can, I can put my hope in that God. Everlasting Father, infinitely caring. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. That is the heart of an infinitely caring father. Prince of peace, to be able to produce peace, to be the producer of peace, the source of peace. We're gonna get into this in future weeks, but peace with God and peace in this life. A healing peace in Isaiah, he is pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds were healed. Paul talked about it to the Ephesians, a reconciling peace destroying the barrier between us and God. And peace in this life. In Philippians four, don't be anxious about anything. Which on the surface we go, ha! Oh, but where's your hope? but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the peace that he has for us and when we recognize that peace, when we go, oh, that's what's available to me, all of a sudden our hope goes, oh, and it's not up to me? The hope comes when we realize it's not up to me to do this, to be better, to, to, to uh, like accomplish more or to get my act together. It's about following Jesus and letting him do the work. And then verse seven, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. In 2 Samuel 7, David was promised that someone from his family line would sit on this throne forever. Guess whose family line Jesus is in, right? And so we go, oh, look, Jesus fulfilled that promise, was the fulfillment of that promise, and then he's the fulfillment of this prophecy. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. But unlike David's reign, the rule of Jesus will never end. How many things that you put your hope in are temporary, right? I heard an interesting use of this phrase, this too shall pass. So if you're in a really bad situation, a lot of times we use it as encouragement, this too shall pass. If you're in a really great situation and everything's going your way, and you're like, yes, who I want to be in office is in office. My kids are getting their act together. The money, we feel whatever about the money. Don't worry, this too shall pass. <laughs> and when we put our hope in these things, it's so temporary in everything in life. Students, how many semesters in school have passed? All of them. Right? How many uh, government leadership uh, seats have passed? All of them. How many things in your life is your hope set on and they're temporary things? The zeal of the Lord 
Another translation of that says passionate commitment. The passionate commitment of God is forever. It's never gonna leave, it's never gonna change. But stuff gets in the way. The next total solar eclipse will be April 8th, 2024, okay? It's gonna be a complete solar eclipse. Gonna get completely in front of the sun, right? You ever done that thing where someone is standing between you and the TV? I think this is a spiritual gift of eight-year-olds. They just know exactly where to stand. You're like, you try and watch, and then you say the, the, the old man thing, like, oh, you make a better door than a window, right? And then that teaches them. And so, they, they do that, or you're, um, you, there's someone between, stand, comes and stands between you and the person that you're talking to, or we've all done that thing where you're walking towards somebody, and you step, you start to move to one side, and they move to the same side, and you do that little dance until finally you just like concede, and you're like, oh. okay. See, we can, when, when we're eclipsed by something, we can try and work our way around. We can kind of see it. We can try and make out what's going on, but it's in the way and we will never receive the full glory of what it's about. You can look in the general direction, which some people treat church that way. I'm gonna look toward God. I'll go to church and I'll, I'll kind of... Some people do it by donating money or time or, or whatever, and you kind of look in the general direction. But what's eclipsing your life right now? What's getting in the way? Is it sin? Is it you living against God, you deciding that what you think, what you want, what society requires has to be what you go for or what you, what you want to do, what feels good, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose that. Is it yourself and your own desire of like, I've gotta, I gotta do me. I gotta make myself happy. I gotta, I gotta work this out. Or your doubt, your misunderstanding, the limits that you put on God because you've made God very small. What's eclipsing your heart? I'll tell you what, if you get more out of social media or the news than you do from the word of God, then your hopelessness is self-inflicted. We need to consider that. What is it that, that's pouring in? Or if you get more satisfaction or you, you're looking for more hope in your GPA or your job or that team or making that team, then your hopelessness is self-inflicted because this is a hope that doesn't disappoint. The hope that God is calling to is a hope that doesn't disappoint and this gift that he has for us is for you and it's worth it. Would you stand with me? Parts of this is you surrendering, each of us surrendering, going God, what is it that you want to do? Okay, I'm, re I'm ready to call it. I'm ready to just be like, all right, my hope, I've tried the money thing, I've tried the success thing, I've tried the friends thing, I've tried the popularity thing, I've, I've done all these things. God, I need you. And prayer team and pastors and elders, if you can come up, and if everybody could bow your heads with me. If you're in a place where you recognize that all the stuff isn't working. It's all been a disappointment and you need to step out and you need to choose to put your hope in the one who doesn't disappoint. Just right where you're at, would you just raise your hand? If this resonates with it, not because I've talked you into it or I've convinced you, but if this is you, just raise your hand right where you're at. And I believe that God's word is true when he promises us that he meets us here and he works all things. And he's gonna use the stuff that has brought so much hopelessness to your life as fuel for the fire that he wants to light in you. And as we sing this song, it's this declaration, it's a pretty bold declaration. Christ alone, cornerstone. 
My hope is built on nothing less. And if you're here this morning and you go, man, my hope is built on all kinds of less. I believe God wants to set you free this morning. As you come to him with a surrendered heart, will you trust that he won't disappoint you? So as we sing this, if your hand was up in the air, or if it wasn't, and this resonates with your heart, would you just come forward? We don't need to know what you're going through. We don't need to know all the details. The prayer team up here right now, what they're gonna do is partner with what Holy Spirit is already doing. So we're gonna let God do the work, but we wanna pray over you. We wanna believe in this change, in this life for you, because God has hope for you. So right now, as we sing this, if that's you, just come on up and let someone pray with you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. we proclaim your truth, your hope over our lives right now. God, I pray that you would break off the yoke of sin, of doubt, of hopelessness right now. We pray this in the name of Jesus, that you would supernaturally do the work that all of our efforts and our attempts could never do. That you would change us, that you would meet us right where we're at. God, that you would remind us you'd convict our hearts when we, we start to try and go it alone. We start to believe and convince ourselves that, oh, we can handle this. That you would come and that you would remove the things that oppress us, that hold us down, and we would surrender to you. And as we go this morning, everybody, I, I wanna encourage you. We will be up here to pray with you and one of the temptations is going to hope that you can do better. You can walk out of here and you're gonna like hope it'll be a better week. But if it's still about you, if it's still about what you're able to do, it's gonna be more of the same. But God can break off the hopelessness as you come to him. So we will be up here. I wanna encourage you to come up, let someone stand with you in faith and pray over you. Otherwise, God bless you. Have a great week.